everybody. This is Phil, Phil Cousineau, your, your friendly pilgrim. I am not home in San Francisco. I'm actually down in Ojai, south of Santa Barbara. I'm here on a writing sabbatical, working to finish my next next book, the Who Stole the Arms of the Venus de Milo tome that I've been working on for 22 years or so. But I'm excited and very grateful to Mango Publishing and my editor and publisher there, Brendan Knight, for helping bring out this new edition of my book, The Art of Pilgrimage. It's rare for a book to be in print for 25 years like this. So I'm grateful and happy to see a beautiful new edition with my old friend and quasi-mentor, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's blurb about the book, um, splashed right on the top of the back, uh, on the, on the top of the front cover about how it, it comes from his introduction to me for the original book launch of The Art of Pilgrimage at our venerable City Lights bookstore in San Francisco back in uh, 1998 when he said after reading the book it reminded him of something that the French poet uh, Jacques Prévert had mentioned to him that all pilgrims are poets with their feet and all poets are pilgrims of their attention and the way that they look at the world. And that's that would be a good way actually to begin this because in some ways you might call me the, the accidental pilgrim. I have written on spiritual topics, especially with Joe Campbell and Houston Smith, but I've also written on a wide range of other uh, topics from music to architecture, uh, Native American issues. And yet this is the one, this is the book that seems to have hit the uh, cultural pulse. And the inspiration originally was simply reading the New York Times travel section, the Sunday travel section, and coming across this, what they used to call a, a little bullet piece that announced that by the year 2000, the travel business was going to surpass the armaments industry as the number one business in the world. In some ways, if you like uh, metaphors, the metaphor there comes right out of the Old Testament that someday we would turn swords into plowshares. So a few wars notwithstanding, this tremendous precipitous rise in travel overall, but pilgrimage really became the inspiration for the book because as all, all good books do, memoir books, have to have a question hovering there. And I'm what I'm asking in this is really two two questions in the book and even in this, this uh, third edition. Why the rise? Why the interest in pilgrimage? And how can we use the metaphor of pilgrimage, which is respectful and in a sense reverential travel, to change, to alter, to deepen virtually any kind of travel, including going home to see the relatives on Thanksgiving, to making a, a walking pilgrimage to the home of Emily Dickinson there in Amherst, Massachusetts, or even taking the family in the footsteps of, let's say, your grandfather to the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. That's how wide our, our net I have cast with this book. And so I converted this, this vision partly sparked by a phenomena that I had seen for years traveling around the world, both as a backpacker and later as a filmmaker, as a recorder of things, that there's a kind of dirty secret in the travel business that so many people are disappointed disappointed that the the city looked better in the Vim Vendors film, uh, Berlin in this case, or it was more interesting in the novel, Milan Kundera writing about Prague. And I, I am so staggered and moved by my own encounters around the world. This reaction always surprised me and even annoyed, as I'm sure some of you have felt once in a while when you hear someone complaining or whining about a destination. So I asked myself, is there another way to travel. I imagine all of you listening in now have thought something similar. Is there a way I can be more attentive, more uh, respectful of a place? 
And naturally, as I began to take notes and try to write up an outline for a possible book proposal, what came to mind was something right in my own uh, bailiwick, right in my own memory, and that is my years of working with Joseph Campbell, the, the mythologist, on the notion of the hero journey, which is something that he got from fellow anthropologists who had been studying the model of the rite of passage, the initiation rite, which is that something breaks or something uh, broken or missing in the life of someone going into an initiation, going through a rite of passage, either in youth or later on in middle or elder age. And that circular journey of transformation that Joe, cobbled, Joe Campbell cobbled together from so many sources, uh, Otto Rank all the way to James Joyce, was part of the inspiration for how I structured the art of pilgrimage, because it's one thing to have a, an idea, let's travel better, right? Let's be more respectful, let's be more so, uh, soulful. But then how? How do you do it? So the original book is divided into uh, seven stages, and it follows a circle. And as so many of my teachers from uh, Van Gogh to Kandinsky to James Joyce, all the way to Campbell, all saw that life was a circle. But Campbell's innovation, and the one that I continue in this book, is that the, the circular journey is counterclockwise, not clockwise. Clockwise, tick, tick, tick goes the clock. That's the pattern of everyday life. That's what everybody else is doing. This is what you have done through most of your life. But the counterclockwise journey is really the signal for a story. You are dropping into dream time. You're dropping into story time. And it always begins with a sense of what I call in the pilgrimage book, longing. You are longing for some kind of change, even a transformation. And to do that, you have to break away, break away from home, family, sometimes take a long break from jobs. This was the model that I found in virtually all of the pilgrimage models that I studied, from the Aborigine model of the walkabout in Australia to the medieval pilgrimages to Rome, Santiago de Compostela, uh, Jerusalem, and, and many others. And that is someone, you and me, we have reached a crossroad. We've reached a crisis, if you will, usually a spiritual crisis, sometimes others. And it's the crisis that precipitates the, the deep journey. If you just want to go on a vacation, God bless you, go have fun. <laughs> if you if you want to go and just be a, a tourist and look at the sites, that's what that original word used to mean. You were going to see the sites. Uh, the, one of the original phrases, funnily enough, was to see the elephant. Can you imagine through the whole 19th century, that was the expression because uh, huge elephants were being transported from North Africa into Europe just to gaze at them, at them with awe and wonder. And that became a metaphor. So I'm going to Venice to see the elephant. <laughs> I'm going to Detroit. <laughs> I'm going to uh, Mexico City to see the elephant. And in some ways, that, that's still the model now. You have seen something, so to speak, in a book, in a movie, uh, maybe a stage play. And then comes the desire to see it for yourself. How many of you listening in right now have felt that urge? It was one thing to see the Vermeer in a book, but how about going to see it for yourself in Amsterdam? It was one thing to see the Alps in an Alfred Hitchcock movie. But if you want to see it for yourself, that can prod, provoke you to a journey. But what distinguishes for me, and this is what I come back to, like a refrain in a song over and over again in my book, is that one considerable difference out of several between the tourist and the pilgrim is in the language itself. As a tourist, it's very common to say, I'm going to take a trip to go back to Ireland. And then while you're in Ireland, you, you will often say probably every day, maybe every hour, I'm going to take a photo. Some days you'll say, I'm going to take home a souvenir. This is a model of aggression and it has been the bane of tourism since the very beginning that we don't look and engage, have, have many conversations with people. We are voyeurs in many uh, 
many ways of that model. We are looking at things without being touched by them. And that's why we are often re, uh, resented by locals. I see it in my own neighborhood in San Francisco, the North Beach, the old beatnik neighborhood. But I've seen it all around the world too. This mixed with a bittersweet, or as the Greek said, sweet, bitter relationship with visitors. How do you turn that around? How can you travel in such a way that people are eager to see you, eager to help, eager to engage you in a conversation or maybe recommend the best of blues club for you in Munich? One of the models is that you turn from take and to give. So again, in my research for about two years, researching the Art of Pilgrimage book, I kept coming across this notion of taking gifts. You come with a gift. It could be religious, spiritual, psychological. It could also be very simple. Uh, years ago, I took 22 16-year-olds from Atlanta, Georgia, around Greece in the footsteps of the myths, but also Saints Peter and Paul. It was a mixed, a mixed message, if you will, of a, of a trip. And one thing that I, I asked them, I said, generally, because they had read my book, by the way, and they asked me to actually take them on a trip. So I asked them to bring gifts. And it was very moving the first night when we all met together as a group and we had a wonderful dinner overlooking, a rooftop dinner overlooking the Parthenon. Some of you have probably been there with me in Athens. And these kids, these 16 year olds were so eager to share what? To share their gift. And then they would ask me uh, very tenderly, so who do I give them to? <laughs> When? When do I give them? So my patent response was, if someone is nice to you, if someone is, uh, ha has moved you in some way, it could be a waiter helping you with your uh, dinner or a concierge helping you take your luggage from the lobby out into the bus. It's an act, act of kindness where you, or if you want to meet someone, you come up and you offer them a gift, you, but you name yourself. I am, let's say, Jack Cousineau. My son was 12 at the time and he accompanied us. I'm Jack Cousineau from San Francisco. And I feel really cool to be here. I feel really lucky. Here's a gift. About 19 of the 22 kids, plus my son Jack, brought music, uh, CDs. This was a few years ago, but I thought that was really touching. Other kinds of gifts, they could be postcards. This is a common one, it's very light. You, anybody can carry them in the backpack. But the notion is that it turns your heart around. It's psychotropic. Now, I don't mean taking drugs. The original meaning was it's some kind of act of attention and intention that turns tropic. It turns your soul, psyche, or your heart around. So you are walking, you're visiting, sauntering around a place with a sense of thanks, with a sense of gratitude. So that's what sets the mood off when we leave home, we are packing. Along the way, one of the gifts, the whole, I think it's chapter three in the book, uh, as in the way. I quote Antonio Machado, the great Spanish poet, who once said, there is no way, comma, pilgrim. There was only the walking of the path. This, this is a paraphrase. But what he's saying is, there is no one path for everybody, every traveler, every pilgrim. You can get some hints, which is what this book is about, hints and suggestions and practices and exercises. But in the end, you make your own path by walking in your individual, unique way. There can be some reminders or some helpful hints. A number of years ago, when I was working with the great historian of religion, Houston Smith, I, who wrote the introduction for my book, by the way, The Art of Pilgrimage, that was a heck of an honor. I just simply, in passing, asked him if he had a practice to begin the day when he was traveling around the world. As he once told me, uh, Phil, I have girdled the globe 12 times. How many times have you girdled the globe? <laughs> I always love that phrase. And when I did ask him that, without hesitation, he said something that I have, I put in the book and I have tried to practice ever since. In the first five or 10 minutes of waking up when you are on the road, wherever your dream trip takes you, the more, the, that opening when you, we are still in the hypnagogic stage, 
halfway between sleep and dream. This is the, the time, as Houston reminded me, it was so simple, but so uncanny. You, you can either immediately order room service, which is always tempting, or turn on CNN, turn on the TV to catch up on the day's news. You could do that. I'm a news hound. I'm, I can't wait to get to the news of the day. But Houston's suggestion, which I feel is a wonderful echo for my book, is that you begin with even five minutes of sacred reading, whatever sacred means to you. If you are walking to Rome and you are traditionally Christian, you might uh, pick up the Gospels. If you are in Chile, as I was shooting a documentary film years ago, I wanted to think of what would be sacred here in Chile. And immediately I thought of the great poet uh, Pablo Neruda. So every morning, before I even slipped out of my hotel room bed, I read a poem by Pablo Neruda. And that has become a kind of a practice for me all around the world. In Ireland, I would read Joyce, Joyce or uh, Yeats or Seamus Haney. And what this does is slowly shift your mind around because you've been sleeping for six, seven, eight hours, whatever it might be. And you want to enter the day in a different frame of mind. This, again, I want to emphasize is one of the, maybe too harsh a word, but the requirements for taking a pilgrimage as opposed to other kinds of travel. There are so many forms of travel. It's sometimes fun just to wake up in a brand new place, not know where you are, not know anything about it, and just walk out like a virgin out into the streets of this new town which I did in Bulgaria years ago. I did it in Albania just two years ago. It seems like 20 years to me now. But sometimes it's thrilling, it's exciting, it's challenging to walk around and not know too much. But by definition, the kind of travel I'm describing is the one that's taking place at the crossroad in your life, maybe even a crisis. And because of that, the pilgrimage is the opportunity for a day, a week, a month, maybe four months if you're walking from Paris to Santiago on the, what they call the Camino, could be four months. And since you've invested so much time, money, heart, you want this to sink in. You want your experience to be more than sheer entertainment. And that's why some of these practices can be very helpful. Uh, a, a simple one for me in the book that I've actually gotten a lot of mail on is at least once in every new site, every country, take your shoes off, go find a park, walk around and feel the earth underneath your feet, what the ancients used to call the, the soul of the world. Also, even if you have done a great deal of reading and research, it's, it's okay, it's permissible, it's even advisable once in a while just to play the fool. And by this, I mean the holy fool, the tradition of the holy fool. And that is when you're in a, in a place, even if you have read about the best gallery in town with all the up and coming art, the pilgrim, by definition, is humble. Is always saying, I've learned a lot, I've meditated, but I can still learn more. And that means asking questions. Most tourists don't, or they're afraid to, to lose or to drop their guard. But when I ask people, even in the groups, the literary groups that I lead around the world, and leading two more next year, by the way, to one to Italy and one to Greece in the spring, the people who enjoy themselves the most, and this is an important word, joy, <laughs> to actually get some joy, not just information out of a culture. The people who get the most joy are the ones who engage, who ask questions. So where's the best live music happening tonight? Where's the best uh, seafood in town? Where's the best view? Simple questions in, in the hopes of being humble, but then also engaging in a kind of conversation that might lead somewhere else to a further conversation. So these are little practices midway through the book about uh, the way, finding your way. Along the way too, I'd like to use the word record. Some of you know I'm a, a word hound. I love the origins of words. And record, if you remember, 
It comes from the old Latin and then the old French, uh, re, re, corde, which means to move through the heart. If you record something, let's say by writing, uh, by sketching, by drawing, which was something nearly every traveler would do before the age of the Kodak camera, by the way, you did it as an aide de memoir. You want to remember what the facade of Notre Dame looks like, or you hope to remember the face of that wonderful old couple in the park in, uh, in, the, in the heart of Dublin, St. Stephen's Green. So you, you shoot with a camera, you draw, you record, you might respond to a place with a poem, with a short story. The recording is what allows you and me to allow an experience to sink in. Most don't. And most of us have a hard time in the end. It's not just growing older. Uh, remembering, was that Exxon Provence or was that Brittany where that encounter took place? By recording, we are respecting the place more than just skittering by and pulling out our uh, selfie sticks and taking a photo of ourselves. What we want to know is our relationship to the rest of the world, to other people. And we do that by musing, by contemplating, by ruminating, by taking a breath, taking time out. Even on my tours, once in a while, I'll ask or I'll put out the notion to people, if you need it, take a morning off, take an afternoon off, take an evening off, and just go get lost. Because in the getting lost, sometimes you won't be hearing the, uh, the prejudices that have come before you, the thoughts that you have garnered from uh, books, friends who are fellow travelers, and so on. So that, that kind of recording is very helpful. Upon maybe just one more stage, and then we'll start to open it up to some questions and comments here. I'm glad to see them coming in. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful to hear from everybody. Thank you. OK. Um, upon arrival, to ensure if not to guarantee, to encourage that your encounter in this new site. So I see a friend just writing in just now about our time in Athens a few years ago. It could be just one more city unless you are prepared in some way. So a couple of, of hints that, that I suggest. One is reading up on a place, some history, of course, the other is reading their poets. On my last trip, this would have just been two years ago, which feels like 200, but I, I was telling the story of Penelope and Odysseus as part of the Odyssey. I like to carry both sides. And I pulled out a book by a wonderful woman from Crete. And in there, she writes is a stunning line that in her Greek imagination, Penelope wasn't waiting, just waiting around and fending off the suitors for 20 years. Instead, instead, she was writing. And that whole metaphor shifts your attention around so that you look at Greek women differently. You look at the old Greek myths differently. That's part of the point of arrival. Take something. It could be music. It could be some artwork. It could be a book that challenges you and also encourages you then to say to somebody else in the group or you know, let's say you're tra traveling with another couple, engaging them again in conversation. So that is one of the notions that I have tried to work in for my tours of the, they began, gosh, 1984 with the poet Robert Bly traipsing around Ireland where we bumped into Seamus Haney and uh, Galway Canal and a number of other famous writers. And, uh, sorry, I'm just, I'm getting, I'm getting lost. Oh, that was okay. So it was right after, right during that time when I began working on the hero's journey, the movie about Campbell. And for a number of years, he and I would meet in New York, San Francisco, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. And, the, the running gag, the running uh, thread through it all was, uh, Joe, do you want to meet for a scotch? Do you? 
let's carry on with a long conversation. And what that referred to was an echo of my respect for the time I had with a, a good mentor that there was no small talk. Immediately, within a minute of meeting with Joe in all these different places while we were filming him, he would immediately say something like, so, Phil, what are you reading? Uh, have you heard any good music recently? Or where are you traveling? Uh, I heard there was a death in your family. It was this desire that I palpably felt that he wanted to plunge, like a dolphin plunge is a great old uh, Greek metaphor. Are you going to take the dolphin plunge and get to it, get to a serious conversation? And that's what I have missed during the pandemic, having these long face-to-face -face conversations with people as students or workshops or bookstores. But this is what I do in all of my tours. I begin each morning by saying, we're in Iraq Leon here on the island of Crete. Today, our Cretan guide, along with me, we're going to take you to a 9,000-year-old goddess cave. Ta -tum, ta -tum, ta -tum. So we would talk for an hour about what this might mean. Uh, let's, let's prepare each other for what we would encounter there. and Let's have some good questions for ourselves, uh, questions for our own souls before we go. And then at the end of every day, and some of you who are listening in now, you've been for some of these dinners. It's the the urge oh, so often in travel, and I exhort all of you to try to avoid this, try to refrain from it, is to, to compare where you are with some other place in your distant travels. I know it's a natural urge, but if you do, the entire day can dissipate like the morning do because you've gotten into this whole business about, well, this reminds me of Bali or this reminds me of growing up in Illinois, whatever it might be. It's natural, but in terms of a deep life-changing, life-transitioning journey, the point is to have exercises that bring you back to the moment. So those conversations at the end of the day, so Karen, I see Karen here. I see uh, Elaine from my past tours. What did you think? Or how did it feel to descend into that cave on Crete? So I'm engaging people and trying to get some kind of response because in that back and forth is the way that memory actually adheres, the way it sticks, uh, the way it begins, it moves in like a war, a whirling spiral into our hearts and makes some kind of difference to us. So with that in mind, could we, let me look at a couple of the questions here. So we're about halfway through. Uh, thank you. Does that sound any better for people? Hello? Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you for, for all your comments. Um, someone's asking if there's anything new or different in the edition. Yeah, there's a beautiful new cover. Um, many new uh, blurbs, endorsements from people that I deeply respect around the world who have uh, had some wonderful things to say about the book over the years. And one reason to include these this time is to show, in a sense, the, the miracle or the marvel, let's say the marvel, of when a book hits the zeitgeist. Because one of the things I believe that's happened with the enormous uptick in pilgrimage is that it means more people are looking for meaning, not just going for entertainment, which has its own place in different stages of our lives, but the, the uptick in pilgrimage in traditional religions, but also pilgrimage in, in the arts, going to arts and sciences, by the way going to uh, game parks or on safari in Africa or the, the, the studios of famous uh, painters or sculptors, Barbara Hepworth, wonderful sculpture museum in Cornwall in the south of England. 
And that tends to be the, the general tone of the feedback that I get. Still thousands of letters. I hear from somebody every day, Uruguay, even Afghanistan recently, people who have been reading the different translations of the book in the different languages. And what, what the echo is again and again, it's so gratifying to hear this helped me find some meaning in, in my travels versus that old 1950s torch song. Is that all there is, my friend? Remember the Peggy Lee song? That breaks my heart when I hear that from somebody that they didn't get any meaning as opposed to people who do. So there is in this new edition, the third edition of the Art of Pilgrimage, there's a new preface that I've added five or six pages in which I address some of these issues also about how the book has somehow found its way among uh, returning veterans from war who have come back and desperately need to find some meaning because something snapped or something broke their spirit when they were in combat and they many of them are looking for and this is this goes all the way back of course to the Iliad some kind of healing journey after their encounters I get a lot of mail from uh, from prisons uh, prisoners who are using what they call the finger labyrinth so they decide where they might go after they are released from prison and they use my book and others uh, pico Iyer is a big favorite with them a uh, lauren artress and her wonderful book about the labyrinth movement around the world as a way to find a thread of meaning back in their life now the, the one story that i tell at the heart of of this new edition of pilgrimage is one that i i still find mystifying and humbling and yet it, it cuts to the quick i believe of the phenomena of finding more meaning and by the way this can happen in great travel literature which i want you to think about too i have an enormous bibliography at the end of this book where i'm recommending that you read people like rose Macaulay, the 19th century traveler who wrote a marvelous book called the pleasure of ruins in which she went to famous ruins around the world alone as a woman and wrote some of the most beautiful prose ever about travel and also solo travel. I recommend uh, the Global Soul by Pico Iyer. And then one of my two or three favorites, uh, The Classes of Marusi by Henry Miller, who went to Epidaurus on the advice of Lawrence Durrell. And while he was there, wrote some of the most stunning prose ever, not only about Greece, but about any travel site where he says, and it's a rough paraphrase, that he feels that he has found the still point of the world there in the ancient 2500 year old theater in Epidaurus. And in some way that could stand in for all great travel writing. There is turmoil in the heart of the traveler, in the heart of the travel writer. And by spiraling into the center of a place that you have long dreamed of visiting, the, in a sense, the announcement of the world or the history of that site that you have um, found yourself in the healing has begun to say Van Morrison is a sense suddenly of stillness in the, the still point of the world as Yeats uh, would have put it. So in this case, uh, five years ago, I was launching the Book of Roads, which is a collection of my travel stories from uh, Michigan to Marrakesh. And I noticed as I was reading some stories that there was a, a family gathered in the front row and it appeared there was a, a, the matriarch, the grandmother sitting in the center, and she had a very elaborate, thick scrapbook on her lap. Next to her was someone who appeared to be her son and probably his wife. I'm surmising all of this as I'm re reading and talking about travel. And then two or three grandchildren on the side and they caught my attention because they were quite serious and i didn't know why so the, the reading went well and i ended up si signing a, a pallet load of books which is always a good thing for a writer and yet this family stayed until everybody else had left then as one they rose to their feet and they walked to me and the grandmother handed me this scrapbook and said in halting but just clear enough english i i didn't know that reading itself could also be a pilgrimage 
until I read your book. Now, it was obviously painful for her to say this. It was uncomfortable. And at that point, then her son stepped forward and with great love said, my mother had a stroke a few years ago and she lost the ability to speak. And she went through many forms of speech therapy. Nothing worked until she met <coughs> uh, a different therapist who asked her a startling question. What is your favorite book in the world? And this woman, well, couldn't speak, but she wrote down on a piece of paper, The Art of Pilgrimage. So this speech therapist said, good, I'm glad you have one. Now, what I want you to do is go to into the book or maybe get a second copy. I never was quite sure about this. And physically with scissors, cut out your favorite passages. Cut out a photo if you like a photo in there. And then transfer it from that book into your own book, your scrapbook. And at this, I thought of that famous line by Emerson, uh, don't be satisfied with the, the, the literature that's come before you. Make your own Bible. <laughs> Collect your famous quotes and authors, and then it's yours. And I think that's essentially what was happening with this older woman. She created this vast, beautiful, sparkling, glittering scrapbook. And then the, the trick was, the therapist said, as you do this, I want you then to try to articulate the words and think about why the words in this book and the photos, why they move you. And I think th this would help. Slowly over the course of, I'm not sure, a year or, or more, this woman was able to teach herself to speak again. And she then handed me that scrapbook and she told me, gave me permission to take it home for the night so I could look at it and then bring it back the next day, which I did. Now, the reason I, I belabor this, this little story is because I, I think, of course, there is a metaphor in this. And like Coleridge, I'm a scavenger after good metaphors. And the metaphor here is that there are certain ways to go through life that allow us to absorb, experience, filter, words, music, sound, sights, <coughs> excuse me, in a way that's beyond normal, or maybe should be the normal way of things, but tends not to be, because it's all great spiritual literature. And even travel literature tells us we're human. <laughs> we tend to fall asleep. We forget things. We forget wisdom. And we need to be retaught, relearned, and we need to be humble enough to do this. That's why we read the great myths, legends, fairy tales. That's why we read great travel liter literature now. But it's got to come with the emotional component. And the emotional component is in that word again, record. If you can learn to move something through your heart, as I believe this wonderful matriarch did with the art of pilgrimage, by memorizing maybe a poem before you go somewhere, memorizing a song that you can sing, let's say at Newgrange in Ireland or the great stone megaliths at Karnak in Brittany, to pull something out of, out of your heart because you have recorded it, you have memorized it, you have memorized a painting in your mind's eye so that when you go to the Louvre or... Uh, the British Museum, the, even the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, that you will be able to experience the world and really yourself in depth again. So I, I hope that story uh, helps people. Maybe it even make, it can make you think about a, a, a book or two or a movie or a song that you had come back to you in your travels. And as these things came back, it allowed you to appreciate the site even more. Uh, so I'm just checking to see if there's any, <laughs> some wonderful thoughts about the cave and the darkness on Crete. So that that will bring up a another memory in, in my own travels, if I'm traveling solo or if I'm going on a film trip or a writing research trip, I was just in Greece 
a couple of years ago to finish my research for my book, the other book that just came out, The Lost Notebooks of Sisyphus, the King of Corinth. So going to Corinth, I had a purpose in mind. And because I had a purpose to learn the hidden story, if you will, of one of the great uh, kings or legendary kings of Crete, things became magnetized. Does that make sense to everybody listening in now? That there is a way to magnetize our five senses, magnetize our memory, so things stick. And then they begin to uh, move us. I, I see a number of comments coming in here about this amazing trip that we had on Crete, 12 days in Crete. And of, of course, we played Zorba the Greek on the, on the uh, stereo system of, of the bus. And that was fun. But what I had to, the, the, the story that I ended up telling on the, the microphone in the front of the bus that many people commented on later was because I, I personalized it. So it wasn't just music for the tourists in the placa in the heart of, of Athens. And it's that one of the few memories I have of my parents, my mom and dad, when I was growing up outside Detroit was uh, New Year's Eve, when my father would put on the soundtrack to Zorba the Greek and turn to my mother and say, Rosemary, let's dance. And they say, even now you can't wipe the smile off my face because what's coming up is this elusive quality of joy that is not talked about enough, in, in my humble opinion, in travel. We, we tend to think about travel in terms of famous places or deep impressions or now is it Instagram worthy or not? Whereas what helps an experience sink in and move us and maybe even transform us is closer to joy. And thankfully, the Cretans have a great word for that and they call it kefi, K-E-F-I. And it's that emotion that begins to surge from you from the land up through your feet similar in a way to the Spanish notion of duende, but I think a little more joyous than Lorca's duende. And it's the urge that makes you want to get up and dance, the urge that makes you want to sing, or the urge that says, I need an hour by myself, and you go off and you write a poem, or you, you disappear from the group so that you can watch the sun setting over the Aegean. You feel that? It's, Kefi is a, the joy that isn't passive. It's actually active. And because of that, it's become more and more an ingredient in uh, all of my travels. With that, uh, so I ask you to think about it for a second. Take, take 20 seconds, 30 seconds, as we have uh, another 15 minutes, it looks like here, and think about how much joy you've had in your travels. Or if you were about to travel somewhere new next year, maybe with me, maybe with another friend, going somewhere, how can you ensure, or at least raise the odds, that you are going to find some joy? Because the, the joy, in many ways, is what is missing in the hero's journey. It's what's missing in most dramas. It's why we set off, why we leave home to go somewhere that might give us some kind of infusion for this. So. Uh, just because I, I like to keep talks, presentations like this fresh, I'll, I'll pass on an, an anecdote about how a man, I'll, I'll call him John, who was on two of my Ireland trips in the past. He wrote me after not, not being silent for probably three years. I hadn't heard from him for at least three years. And I was wondering, of course, what had happened to him. Sent him a couple of postcards, didn't hear back. Well, he, he wrote to me, yesterday morning that he was listening to Van Morrison's song, Raglan Road, which is recorded on his album with the Chieftains. And it's based on a wonderful, wondrous poem by the great rural Irish poet, Patrick Kavanagh. And this song is famous in so many circles. Luke Kelly does a magnificent version too, about a kind of epiphany that this lonely country boy is walking along the streets of Dublin and he peers across the street in the driving rain and he sees a raven-haired woman who captivates him 
And this is based on a true story about Patrick Kavanaugh in his own life. So he writes this song and this, so my friend John writes to me that this, he remembered this as the capstone of a 12 day tour that we had had around Ireland because when we got back, I offered to take the group in the driving rain, by the way, to the street corner where Patrick Kavanaugh had his epiphany, which that means it's an old Greek word. It means the light is shining through all the darkness in your life. And I took the group there and the, uh, an, an ex-nun who had become the world's authority and Patrick Kavanaugh joined us. And she had a recording of Van singing Raglan Road. And there were maybe a dozen of us standing there in the pouring rain, covered with umbrellas, listening to Van Morrison sing this 60, 70 year old ballad about lost love. And by the end of it, we were all weeping with joy because of the multi-layered nature of this experience. We were there where something important happened, which was memorialized in a poem, which was then memorialized again forever, you might say, by one of the great singers of our era. And then that all reaches into us. Why this becomes then a doubly and triply important anecdote is that my friend John's wife had died a year ago. And that while she was slowly fading away, they th often thought about great travel memories, uh, visits, experiences in these places that weren't just interesting, weren't just famous, weren't just uh, thrilling and Instagram worthy, but instead had touched them. And John told me that th this moment on the street corner with his wife was one of those moments. And he wanted to reach out after a few years and thank me for that. I belabor this second anecdote at length because in a sense, this is what I have been trying to pass on really all my life. I grew up in a household full of books, as many of you know, in Detroit, just down I-94 from all of you in Chicago. And I have such fond memories of, of Chicago because we would, my family would read books out loud, classics out loud together. And then very often we would go to the places that inspired those books. So we read Moby Dick and we went off to uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, to the site where Melville wrote the book. It was a brilliant style of teaching that my father uh, really drilled into me. We went to Toledo to look at a sculpture exhibit based on the Iliad that we were writing or reading it together as a family. And we also went off to Chicago because we had fallen in love with New York over the years. And my dad wanted to take us to see the Edward Hoppers. So I guess what I'm, what I'm driving at is that somehow I was inculcated, inspired, uh, galvanized by a certain way of living in the world. And in a simple way, it's three act structure, live, read, live again. <laughs> or you could say live, travel, live again. So three acts, there's a setup. And then in the middle is the active part of our lives where we uh, re-engage with friends again. We read, we travel, we listen to music that moves our souls. And then we come back to the real world. It's a kind of endless cycle. And I've been fortunate enough to, to do that for a living as a writer, a, a travel guide occasionally every year or two, and then as a filmmaker. And a, a last note on that, it seems so many of my, uh, the, tra the travel suggestions that I originally put in the book in 1998 came from my early years of uh, becoming a, a documentary filmmaker. And in the subsequent years, working on probably another 20 films and then many episodes for the, our Global S Spirit series on PBS, I've, in a sense, I've had to become the pilgrim over and over again, every time I'm interviewing people, where I have to be respectful, attentive, looking at them, regarding them not top down as the intellectual or scholar or someone from the West interviewing somebody from the East, always as an equal, be informed, be respectful, take notes, <laughs> ask questions, 
Uh, be constantly humble so that in the last stage, both of the book, but also it seems our own lives is uh, the element, the question that is probably posed to me more than any other over these uh, 25 years that the book has been out. And that is, Phil, loved your book, but now I'm home and I'm miserable. <laughs> or Mr. Cousineau, you, you, your book helped change my life, but I don't know how to keep it alive, keep the travel, the experience, the emotions, the attentiveness. How do I keep that alive when I get home? Uh, I, I see one wonderful comment here in the comment list uh, by somebody, Louise Penny, Surprised by Joy, the C.S. Le Lewis book. That's actually a good transition to this last stage because those of you who may have read the book, you'll see that I uh, end chapter seven, coming home again, I call it the boon, which is that great word from myth. It's the gift that you got on your travels, which is generally equated with wisdom. Something changed. You learned something about yourself. You learned it about a foreign culture. You learned something new about the world itself. And then the question is, does it depress you? <laughs> does it bring you down with how much knowledge or insight or compassion you've learned? Or are you, as Louise Penny has just reminded me here, surprised by joy? And I think you can be, actually should be at some point on the travels and then again at home. And I suggest that the odds of you learning what the boon really was are magnified if you actually ask that question of yourself every day of your trip, a week, two weeks, a month, however gone you along. Ask it of yourself in a journal. Ask it of, let's say, your spouse or your best friend that you're driving with. It's a kind of musing. There is no right answer. You're not trying to be cool or hip or the greatest traveler in the world since Anthony Bourdain, right? It's what was the gift today? What jumped out? What? challenged me. So I better think about this, right? And at the end of that comes a kind of humility. You ask yourself that every day of the, of the journey so that when you come home, for some it's actually on, at uh, customs on the way home or on the airplane or on, in your taxi drive back to your house, you say, so what happened? What what are the three greatest memories? Write them down. There's no perfect answer, but it begins you thinking so that you can appreciate one of the final points that I was able to make in the in the book it was inspired by a chance lecture I went to by uh, the great Buddhist scholar uh, Thich Nhat Han from Vietnam who was asked about pilgrimage in the Buddhist tradition. And he said very humbly, as you might expect, um, the true value of pilgrimage is the ability, the capacity to return home and to look at your neighborhood, your circle of friends and family, your backyard as sacred. Not that, geez, I, I was just in Bhutan or Bali and my neighbors haven't been there. Or uh, my dad never got there. There's a strange kind of social one-upmanship that can happen in the world of travel. But Thich Nhat Hanh's advice brings things back to a kind of parody. Uh, in, 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 I find it very inspiring because that's how a poet thinks. That's how a filmmaker things. That's how writers, dancers, uh, all kinds of artistic people, and I've learned by doing so many films with indigenous people, that's how indigenous people think too. I remember uh, Reub Reuben Snake, the Winnebago uh, medicine man, who Houston Smith said was the American Dalai Lama, which I always loved, where Reuben said, Phil, <laughs> we, we Indians, we think that every place in God's green earth is sacred, but some places are a little more sacred than others. And I thought, well, that, that, that's a way to think about pilgrimage. My life here at home is wonderful, sacred, troubled, but sacred. 
if I go out there, I'll find something sacred. But will I be grateful, thankful, compassionate? And then will I pass that on to someone else? So maybe the last little suggestion, because I'm, I'm getting some wonderful notes coming in here about how good the, how important it is to actually have reified uh, suggestions, something real in the world. And that's this. When you come home from a, a trip, even if it's a troubling one, a disturbing one, um, and in some way there should be something that throws you, actually just throws you out of orbit, which is the original meaning for disturbed that, by the way, you were in this orbit. And now it's something you learned on that trip throws you, as my trip to the townships in Cape Town, South Africa did for me years ago. Never been the same since because of those. And that is you get home and either you throw a small dinner party, whatever you want to call it, or you uh, meet with a best friend or two or three at a neutral ground, cafe, uh, your na neighborhood saloon, cheers, style. And you pick these friends in these places advisedly, but what you want to do is begin to tell two or three deeply true stories about what happened to you. And it is no social gamesmanship here. It should be you revealing yourself. And then in turn, you ask that person, have you ever experienced that? Did you ever feel this? Did you feel like a, a, a fish out of water? You, there are so many metaphors for, for this business. Did you feel the, the cultural clash somewhere? So let's talk about that. In this way of telling stories when we get home, uh, maybe if you've been to Greece, you go to a Greek restaurant. That's one way to actually stimulate uh, all five senses when you begin telling these stories. If you do that, sometimes uh, the memories will deepen because of it. And there's also a chance that whoever you choose to meet with, and I know there's a Elaine here and a couple of friends from other tours of mine who've been doing this, it can, it, become, it can become something you don't need to do, but want to do on a regular basis. Why? Because travel helps engage all of us in this deep conversation, the, the long conversation, which I think is what we're uh, longing for. This is why we travel. What was it? the famous line by Mark Twain? Uh, travel is the death of prejudice. Uh, there are exceptions, of course. It can deepen some people's prejudices but generally there is that uh, the, the lights going off what it rilke said that when he visited the south the, the german poet rilke when he visited the south of france he understood why cezanne painted the same mountain i think it's mount victoire over and over and over again because rilke said he must have felt a conflagration of clarity it's, that's a mind-altering phrase, isn't it? But that, that comes to me almost every day when I have a memory, sometimes by smell, sometimes by ear, sometimes by sight, of a place I've come to love somewhere in the world. And a smile, a wry smile will come back on my face when I, I, I realize that when I'm at my best in traveling and passing my love of the road, my love of new experiences on to other people like all of you who have tuned in today, that uh, all these places are in me at all times. And I hope a few, a few things that I said today will help make this possible for you or for you to believe in this <laughs> evermore. Uh, I do want to encourage you to champion Barbara's books there in Chicago, or if you're from elsewhere, your local equivalent of a great independent bookstore. It's through your interest in buying a book here and there, even if it's not my Art of Pilgrimage today. Go out and buy, let's say, a Rebecca Solnit's wonderful book on walking. It, that will alone, that will change the way that you walk or saunter in the, the city of your next destination. Uh, Pico Iyer's books about his uh, his life in Japan. Paul Theroux, 
his wonderful travel books, which my father began to send me. I was thinking about that last night when I was a house painter for several years in Detroit, in uh, San Francisco, when I first moved out here to California. And he was afraid that I would never get back to my writing. So he started sending me what he thought were the world's greatest travel books. <laughs> what a gift, right? It, it kept my love of travel alive until I finally put down those paintbrushes. <laughs> so please sponsor your local bookstores. Um, think about joining one of my tours sometime in the future. Uh, God willing, or the God's willing, the pandemic will have simmered down by early next spring and we'll be back on the road. And um, I wish all of you safe and soulful travels. Thank you.